Welcome to the Serial Killer Podcast, the podcast dedicated to serial killers, who they were, what they did, and how. I am your Norwegian host, Thomas Vyborg Thun, and tonight, dear listener, a long-awaited episode. But before we start, I must mention that it has been selected from three candidates, and it was my dear listener Renee who has credit of choosing tonight's subject. As mentioned in earlier episodes, great things are happening with the Serial Killer podcast. I apologize for the delay in publishing the last couple of months, but this will now change. I have great news. From now on, this podcast is partnered up with the Podcast One Network. Podcast One hosts over 200 excellent podcasts from a variety of people, such as Adam Carolla, Larry King, and one of my very favorite authors, Brett Easton Ellis. With this, I am now able to publish more regularly, and you, dear listener, will get a fresh new episode the 1st and 15th of every month from now on. Also, please check out my fan page on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash the SK podcast for discussion, bonus content, and frequent interaction with me, your humble host. Also, feel free to visit my website at theserialkillerpodcast.com and of course my Patreon page at patreon.com slash theserialkillerpodcast. Any donation, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated. I have in previous podcasts mentioned the so-called serial killer superstars. I have even featured a few, such as Jeffrey Dahmer, BTK and John Wayne Gacy, but none of them come close to the notoriety of this evening's subject. He shocked a nation, if not a world, with his handsome movie star looks, his high intelligence and suave charm combined with a never-ending hunger for extreme sexual violence and murder. No one knows exactly how many women met their doom at the hands of him, but according to the FBI, it could be as few as 30 and as many as 130. He enjoyed lying and manipulating and controlling those he was in contact with. His Ultimate goal was total domination, and his name was Theodore Robert Bundy. Tonight, dear listener, will not be a very graphic episode. Because Ted Bundy is so famous, many books, films, and articles have been written about him. And to tell his story in only one episode would not be very responsible or in spirit of this podcast's endeavor to delve into the details of serial killers' lives. So this episode will feature the beginning. Imagine, if you will, dear listener, Vermont, in late autumn, early winter. It's the 24th of November, the first post-war year of 1946, and Eleanor Louise Cowell, by most known as Louise, aged 22, was on a bed at the Elizabeth Lynn home for unwed mothers, and she was screaming. She was screaming because she was giving birth to a healthy baby boy, whom she named Theodore Robert Cowell. Shortly after his birth, Ted and his mother moved back to the home of his grandparents in the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia. This was, as in my podcast episode regarding the Happy Face Killer, the age of innocence, the late 1940s to 1960s America. Philadelphia, at the time, was a corrupt city. It was largely run by the Angelo Bruno Mafia family, who, through threats of violence and bribes, controlled both the police and the mayor. Tourists to the city were thus protected, as they were considered good for business. But the locals, for them, it could be a tough city. 
The city, despite its moniker of brotherly love, was segregated into white, Chinese, and black neighborhoods, and within those very much divided by class. Being working class, Ted's mother might have realized the tough city of Philadelphia would not be an ideal place to raise children, and moved out from her parents' house and moved to the more tranquil area of Tacoma, Washington, when Ted was four years old. Ted was a peculiar-looking child. Looking at various photos of him, it's obvious that his famous trait of constantly changing his appearance was prevalent, even as a kid. In one photo, wearing a cowboy outfit, he has a kind of a square-looking head with a pronounced overbite and upturned nose. In another photo, apparently from a family Christmas celebration, he looks very different, with a slim, innocent-looking face, evenly spaced eyes and a pleasant smile. But as was extreme in Ted's case, appearances can very much be deceiving. From a very early age, Ted gravitated toward the macabre. One particularly chilling childhood story includes three-year-old Ted assembling a collection of kitchen knives around his sleeping aunt. When his aunt awoke to the disturbing display, she looked up to see tiny Ted staring at her from the end of the bed. This behavior is not unique to Ted, and the avid listener will have noticed that several other serial killers have displayed such odd, macabre traits at a very early age. For example, Keith Jesperson and Jeffrey Dahmer. The common theme is death. For Ted, it would be a combination of possession and violence. Where Keith and Jeffrey were respectively obsessed with violence and death, Ted was obsessed with both. In addition to acting very much like a young Damien from the film Omen, surrounding his aunt with knives, young Ted often captured small animals. He would then keep them for extended periods of time, toying with them, before torturing and killing them using either his hands or a knife. While growing up, Ted was led to believe that his grandparents were his parents, and his natural mother was his older sister. The charade was created in order to protect his biological mother from harsh criticism and prejudice of being an unwed mother. His grandmother, whom he was told was his mother, was a timid and obedient woman. She did not, however, provide Ted with a stable upbringing, as she was prone to extreme bouts of depression and hysteria, and on at least one occasion had to be admitted to undergo electroconvulsive therapy. A year after they moved, Louise fell in love with a military cook named Johnny Culpepper Bundy. In May of 1951, the couple was married, and Ted assumed his stepfather's last name, which he would keep for the rest of his life. The newlyweds purchased a four-bedroom, one-and-a-half-bathroom house in Tacoma, a very middle-class neighborhood, and according to pictures, a very pleasant house. It had a cozy fireplace, big comfortable living room chairs, a spacious kitchen, and large windows allowing plenty of sunlight. It might have protected Louise that Ted was told she was his older sister, but for young Ted, it was very much a source of emotional pain and victimization later in life. And even though he was raised by his mother in a now very typical nuclear family middle-class household, she did not reveal to him that she was his mother, and Ted didn't know for certain until his college years. Along with an interest in death, Ted was known to obsess over material objects. When Ted's mother married John Bundy in 1951, Ted was reportedly ashamed of his stepfather's modest earnings as a military chef, and was mortified that John drove a sensible rambler. 
Even as a young child, Ted would drag his mother to the most expensive clothing displays at the department store, asserting his penchant for materialistic goods. Over the years, the Bundy family added four other siblings, who Ted spent much of his time babysitting after school. In an attempt to distance himself from his stepfather, Ted began calling him John instead of father and refused to become close with his four half-siblings. Ted's stepfather Johnny really did try to form a bond between himself and Ted by including him in camping trips. He enrolled Ted in the Boy Scouts of America organization, went fishing with him and other typical father-son activities. However, Johnny's attempts were unsuccessful, and Ted remained emotionally detached from his stepfather. According to Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth's book Ted Bundy, Conversations with a Killer, Ted became increasingly uncomfortable around his stepfather and preferred to be alone. This desire for solitude would perhaps today be called being introverted, and this trait followed him for many years. Although many contemporaries regarded him as a social man when he entered college. Young Ted didn't look up to his stepfather, but he did adore his biological grandfather, Samuel Cowell. He was, according to Bundy's aunt and Cowell's other daughter, a terribly violent man. He abused and tortured neighborhood animals, beat his children and generally acted both vulgar and violently. Ted remembers in an interview that Samuel at one point shoved Ted's aunt down the stairs as punishment for oversleeping, and he often physically abused Ted as well. According to the work of Michaud and Ainsworth, it's even possible that his grandfather was actually his biological father, thus making Ted the result of the incestuous rape by Samuel of Ted's mother Louise. Looking at photos of Ted as a child on the beach together with his grandfather, it is almost eerie how similar to the adult Ted the grandfather appears. To add insult to injury, Samuel was also responsible for introducing young Ted to porn. One time when Ted was still in preschool, he was playing in his grandparents' garden and went into the small greenhouse they kept. There he found a wide variety of pornography that Samuel had collected. It included images of rape fantasies, bondage, and perhaps even more deviant images, more than capable of permanently disturbing a fragile young mind. As a youth, especially right before Ted began high school, he was terribly shy, self-doubting and uncomfortable in social situations. These are quite typical traits among those we today might label introverts, and are often a major challenge to them in an ultra-social arena such as grade school and junior high. And it thus follows, as with so many other serial killers, Ted was a victim of bullying in his formative years. Today, most schools have anti-bullying programs, and although the effects of these programs are a topic of debate, teachers no longer look idly on as young children relentlessly attack each other. Children can often be very cruel and especially in the immediate post-war era, there wasn't any protection from the teaching staff given to kids being bullied. It was thought that bullying was simply something one had to overcome, something that gave a young man character. And as such, victims of bullying would often go many years being relentlessly bullied, day after day after day. Dear listener, you might grow weary of listening to me repeat the subject of bullying in my exploration of the serial killer phenomenon, but I really do think 
It holds some of the keys to understanding what causes these young girls and boys to become inhuman, depraved monsters. So, Ted was often teased for his awkward manners and made the butt of pranks by bullies in his junior high school. Even as a boy, Ted always looked preppy. He wore expensive clothes intended more for formal occasions, such as shirts and long pants instead of t-shirts and shorts. He took care to comb his hair instead of leaving it bushy and long. And he was always the teacher's pet, polite, attentive and eager to help. As many of my listeners may have experienced themselves when attending school, behavior like this is like a magnet for bullies, especially those that perhaps themselves struggle with poor grades and troubled backgrounds. Biographer Michaud has analyzed Ted's behavior and decided that he was, and I quote, not like other children. He looked and acted like them, but he was haunted by something else, a fear, a doubt, sometimes only a vague uneasiness that inhabited his mind with the subtlety of a cat. He felt it for years, but he didn't recognize it for what it was until much later. Regardless of the humiliating experiences he sometimes suffered from being different, he was very diligent in his schoolwork and able to maintain a high grade point average that would continue throughout high school and later into college. Ted attended Woodrow Wilson High School at 1202 North Orchard Street, Tacoma, Washington State, from 1962 to 1965. The school is still in use and looks very similar as it did 52 years ago. It's a blocky square red brick three-story building with a white bell tower protruding from the roof in the middle. At the sides there are brick ales forming half crescents, making the school a handsome, albeit somewhat unimpressive building to look at. Looking at his yearbook photo from 1965, Ted looks like the quintessential all-American young man. He has a pleasant, almost shy smile, Somewhat dark eyebrows, a neat suit and tie, and short, conservative-looking dark hair, parted on the side. During his high school years, Ted appeared to blossom into a more gregarious young man. His popularity increased significantly, and he was considered to be well-dressed and exceptionally well-mannered. Despite his emerging popularity, Ted seldom dated. His interests lay more in extracurricular activities, such as skiing and politics. In fact, Ted had a particular fascination with politics, an interest that would years later temporarily land him in the political arena. There is another yearbook photo of Ted, actually in his political science class, one where he obviously doesn't know he is being photographed and there he looks very relaxed. He is impeccably dressed in shirt and sweater, has the same short conservative haircut, and the tagline of the photo reads, and I quote, Ted Bundy and Dan Birnell in political science. Just wait till he turns his back, then throw it, end quote. If I should interpret this, I would hazard a guess that Ted, looking to his left, is saying to his schoolmate, urging him to play a prank on either the pictured Dan or maybe the class teacher. Now, I have a small treat for you, dear listener. It's always a challenge finding detailed material on the childhood and youth of famous serial killers. Most true crime writers and academics tend to focus on the serial killer's shocking crimes as an adult and provide little information other than superficial listings of facts. In Ted's case, however, I, your humble host, have managed to find the transcript of an interview done with one of Ted Bundy's high school contemporaries, named Jim Adams. 
It's not very long, obviously done by a student, but it has some very interesting first-person insights. Jim Adams attended the class below Ted Bundy and graduated in 1966, a year later than Ted. When asked if he had any contact with Ted during his high school years, he answered, Not a whole bunch. I knew him because we had some friends in common. One friend in particular was Leonard Hoffman, and sometimes I would ride with Leonard and him, Ted, after school. They'd give me a lift home, or we'd go get a hamburger or something, as high school people are wont to do. Leonard and I were both in Latin class together, but he was probably a closer friend to Ted. Ted was a kinda sochi guy in high school, a guy who'd probably wear slacks, a shirt and sweater, sometimes a tie. I think he was popular with the teachers because he was a good student, and he was pretty popular with some of the best-looking gals too. I remember he had one girlfriend that was in Latin class with Leonard and I. It was a real pretty gal. And it was interesting when they talked about his standard kind of woman that he was interested in. You know, the type he seemed to be attracted to. End quote. The interviewer, who happens to be an attractive brunette, then proceeds to mention Ted's affinity with girls having long dark hair parted in the middle. And Jim answers, Yeah, good thing you don't part yours in the middle. She was a real pretty brunette. Gosh. I can't remember her name now, but she was one of the prettiest girls in the class, and I know that she dated Ted for a while. End quote. Anne Rule, author of the book The Stranger Beside Me, mentioned that someone she had interviewed described Ted as being shy and almost introverted, although charismatic. In response to this, Jim says, He was quiet, maybe a little reserved. I don't know if he was shy. It seemed to me he was quite confident, um, but maybe just a little reserved. He wasn't as boisterous as the rest of us. End quote. Following high school, Ted attended college at the University of Puget Sound and the University of Washington. Both of these universities exist and are well regarded both in the U.S. and internationally. Washington U is ranked at number 54 nationally, while Puget Sound, and uh, listen, I don't know if it's Puget or Puget, is currently ranked at number 68 among liberal arts colleges. He worked his way through school by taking on several low-level jobs, such as busboy and shoe clerk. However, he seldom stayed with one position for very long his employers considered him to be unreliable. Although Ted was inconsistent with his work outside of school, he was very focused on his studies and grades. Yet his focus changed during the spring of 1967, when he began a relationship that would forever change his life. Ted met a girl that was everything he had ever dreamed of in a woman. She was a beautiful and highly sophisticated woman from a wealthy Californian family. She was slim and had dark, long hair that she usually parted either in the middle or slightly to the side. Because of Ted's extreme notoriety, her name is not public knowledge, at least not that I could find, and Bundy biographers use pseudonyms when they name the woman. The most common pseudonym is Stephanie Brooks. And that is the name I'll use too. Ted couldn't believe someone from her class would have an interest in someone like him. Although they had many differences, they both loved to ski, and it was during their many ski trips together that he fell in love. She was really Ted's first love. And, according to Anne Rule, possibly the first woman with whom he became involved with sexually. However, she was not as infatuated with Ted as he was with her. In fact, she liked Ted a lot, but believed he had no real direction or future goals. Ted tried too hard to impress her. As most psychopaths, Ted was a habitual liar, 
He didn't see anything wrong with telling lies if it got him closer to his various goals, and he lied repeatedly to Stephanie in order to impress her, only to achieve the exact opposite. She, unsurprisingly, did not appreciate being lied to. Michaud writes that Ted won a summer scholarship to the prestigious Ivy League Stanford University in California, just to impress her. But at Stanford, his immaturity was exposed. He writes, Ted did not understand why the mask he had been using had failed him. This first tentative foray into the sophisticated world had ended in disaster. End quote. In 1968, after his girlfriend graduated from the University of Washington, she broke off relations with Ted. She was a practical young woman and seemed to realize that Ted had some serious character flaws that took him out of the running as husband material. Ted never recovered from the breakup. Nothing, including school, seemed to hold any interest for him, and he eventually dropped out dumbfounded and depressed over the breakup. He managed to stay in touch with her by writing after she returned to California, yet she seemed uninterested in getting back together. Ted became obsessed with this young woman, and he couldn't get her out of his mind. Many Bundy biographers indicate that Bundy being dumped by Brooks was the catalyst for his later murderous exploits but, as we shall discuss further on, I'm not so sure. In addition to being dumped by what he later stated was his first true love, in 1969 Bundy learned his true parentage. His sister was actually his mother, and his parents were actually his grandparents. Not unexpectedly, this late discovery had a rather serious impact on him. Biographer Michaud says that his attitude towards his mother did not change much, but he became nasty and surly to Johnny Bundy, his kind stepfather. It's hard to say whether the knowledge that his mother had deceived him all his life had any impact on his other character flaws which were beginning to blossom. Throughout Ted Bundy's high school and college years, there was always a cloud over his reputation for honesty. Many people close to him suspected him of petty theory, and workmates knew him to be deceitful, unreliable, dishonest. According to Marilyn Bardsley, the now defunct but once excellent website crime libraries serial killer expert, Ted's psychopathic nature was being revealed, but most of the people that witnessed it did not realize what they were experiencing. Stealing without any sense of guilt and, in fact, a sense of entitlement is a common trait in a psychopath. Also, psychopaths get a thrill from the excitement and danger that stealing and shoplifting presents to them. For Ted, it had an additional motivating factor as well. He loved to own things, to possess them. Soon Ted's dishonesty evolved from stealing small things at work and school situations to shoplifting, to burglarizing homes for televisions and other items of value. He would prowl his local suburban streets, both on campus and in the nearby residential areas, looking in from the dark into the light of unknowing people's homes and lives. Sometimes he found a house empty, and he would break in, steal various items, not always because he needed a new TV or radio, but because he liked the thrill of it, tell himself it was just a game, that he was too clever to be caught and that he would never, ever take it any further. It was all just a fantasy, and nothing wrong with a bit of fantasy, he thought. At one point he started to break into homes while people were still in them, sleeping. Bundy was always very selective when telling of his crimes to investigators, but we will probably never know how many people have slept the sleep of the innocent 
while Ted stood over them, watching, perhaps with an ice pick or crowbar in his hand. He changed from a shy and introverted person to a more focused and dominant character. He was driven as if to prove himself to the world. He re-enrolled at the University of Washington and studied psychology, a subject in which he excelled. Bundy became an honor student and was well liked by his professors at the university. Ted Bundy had found, if you will, a mask that finally worked. During this time, Ted adopted his Hollywood good looks. He started growing his hair out, having it loose and long, emphasizing his charming brown curls. He became a fitness enthusiast and loved skiing, running, going to the gym and other activities that kept him in peak physical condition. Sometimes he wore a scraggly beard, but from what I can tell he mostly kept himself clean-shaven. Judging from photos from this time in his life, Ted had a very chiseled look, with a prominent jawline, high cheekbones, and a winning, although somewhat mischievous, smile. It's also at this time when Ted met Elizabeth Kendall, a pseudonym under which she wrote The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy, a woman with whom he would be involved with for almost five years. Elizabeth, from what I could tell, was not a brunette nor was she particularly tall or classically attractive as most of his future victims tended to be. She had a sort of timid appearance, was much shorter than Ted and very slim. Elizabeth worked as a secretary and was a somewhat shy and quiet woman. She was a divorcee who seemed to have found in Ted Bundy the perfect father figure for her infant daughter. Elizabeth was deeply in love with Ted from the start, and wanted to one day marry him. However, Ted said he was not yet ready for marriage, because he felt there was still too much for him to accomplish. His drive, determination and confidence was something she loved, and even though she knew that Ted didn't feel as strongly for her as she did for him, she held on. She even felt that on many occasions Ted was meeting with other women. Yet Elizabeth hoped that time would bring him around to her and he would eventually change his ways. She was unaware of his past relationship with his girlfriend from California, the beautiful Stephanie Brooks, and that they still continue to keep in contact and visit each other. Outwardly, Ted's life in 1969 to 1972 seemed to be changing radically for the better. He was more confident, with high hopes for his future. Ted began sending out applications to various law schools, while at the same time he became active in politics. He worked on a campaign to re-elect the Washington governor Daniel J. Evans, a position that allowed Ted to form bonds with politically powerful people in the Republican Party. Dan Evans was a very different Republican than what we are used to in the 21st century America. An interesting fact is that Evans was solely responsible for the creation of the liberal bastion of the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, for which the college honored him for by naming its library after him. He was a social conservative, but liberal on environmental policies, and even fought unsuccessfully for a Washington state income tax. Ted's job while working on Evans' campaign was to follow Evans' main Democratic opponent around, tape record his speeches and report back to Evans personally. Ted also performed volunteer work at a crisis clinic dedicated to suicide prevention on a work-study program, and Rule was his co-worker there, and she wrote an excellent book about her experience, called The Stranger Beside Me. In her book, she tells of how they met at the call center, and how he was charming, confident, and very handsome. She was quite a bit older than Bundy, but recalls, and I quote, As far as his appeal to women, I can remember thinking that if I were younger and single, or if my daughters were older, 
this would be almost the perfect man. End quote. On the first day at a volunteer crisis clinic, he brought her a cup of coffee, looked out at the small sea of phone banks, and told her with a smile, You think we can handle all this? He was pleased with the path his life was taking at this time. Everything seemed to be going in the right direction. In 1970, Bundy was walking along Green Lake in Seattle when he noticed a small boy of around three years old wandering around on his own into the water. Bundy acted fast as he saw how the child started to struggle in the waves. He ran down to the water, jumped in and swam out to the boy and brought the child back to shore. For this heroic act, he was commended by the Seattle police. In 1973, during a business trip to California for the Washington Republican Party, Ted met up with his old girlfriend Stephanie Brooks. She was amazed at the transformation in Ted. He was much more confident and mature, not as aimless as he was when they last dated. They met several other times afterwards, unknown to his steady girlfriend Elizabeth. During Ted's business trips, he romantically courted a lovely young woman from California, and she once again fell in love with him. She loved the new Ted. In her mind, he seemed so dedicated, so confident, and obviously someone who would be able to provide for her and her future children. Marriage was a topic brought up more than once by Ted over their many intimate rendezvous during the fall and winter. Apparently, he was a great lover, if maybe a little rough. Yet, just as suddenly as their romance began, it changed radically. Where once Ted lavished affection upon her, he was suddenly cold and despondent. It seemed as if Ted had lost all interest in her in just a few weeks. She was clearly confused about this new Ted. In February 1974, with no warning, no explanation, Ted ended all contact with her. She was devastated and heartbroken. Her hopes and dreams of beginning a life with her dream husband came crashing down. She pleaded with him, called him repeatedly and begged, but to no avail. Ted had planned this for years. He wanted to see her in pain. The same pain he had felt when she dumped him by the wayside so long ago. Now his plan of revenge had worked. He rejected her as she had once rejected him. She was never to see or hear from Ted again. And so, dear listener, ends part one of the tale of Ted Bundy. The next episode will air on the 1st of November. So, as they say in the land of radio, stay tuned. I have been your host, Thomas Warburg Thun, Doing this podcast is a labor of love, but I couldn't do it without partnering up with the excellent people at podcastone.com. Also, this podcast has been able to bring serial killer stories to life thanks to you, dear listener, and especially those of you that support me via Patreon. There are especially a few patrons that have stayed loyal for a long time. Maud, Wendy, Linda, Thomas, Megan, and Craig, your monthly contributions really help keep this podcast alive. You have my deepest gratitude. As always, thank you, dear listener, for listening. And feel free to leave a review on your favorite podcast app or website. And please do subscribe to the show if you enjoy it. Thank you, good night, and good luck.